50-50 chance. Now, in fact, this alone, by the way, and I actually had a slide of numbers, but I decided to remove it. But if you, if you work this out, if you assume a 60% success rate, you have to ask yourself, I'll, I'll say this, because I think it's really important. If we were, had a 60% success rate, how many missiles would you have to send to this country to have a 95% chance of, of having one hit? Well, you'd need five, OK? So if you're a country, and nuclear weapons, are, once you know how to build them, are actually relatively cheap. They're certainly cheaper than the $10 billion a year we spend on missile defense to produce a system that doesn't work. But you've got to ask yourself, from a proliferation perspective, if you're a country that can produce one weapon or 10 weapons, can you produce 50 weapons? And if we have a missile defense system that we claim to be 50% effective, what are we encouraging those countries to do? We've ma but the worst part about it is we've made this unsuccessful missile defense system a part of our foreign policy. We not only want to defend this country with a system that doesn't work against a threat, which at this point is non-existent, but we want to defend other countries. And we're creating diplomatic problems in Europe by wanting to put a, a similar missile defense system, an equally unworkable missile defense system, in Poland. Anyway, I think I've talked about those two issues. And hopefully I've... Uh, the other thing I would... The last thing I want to say is, you have to ask yourself, what's the strategic purpose of a ballistic missile defense system? See, ballistic is the important word. I'm a physicist. What does ballistic mean? It means it's like a baseball. Okay. It follows the laws of physics. You shoot it up and it comes down. And the great thing about ballistic means when you shoot it up and it comes down, you can figure out where it came from. So any country that wants to attack us with a, with a nuclear weapon is marking their country with a big X. Okay? You've got to ask yourself, is that more likely a possibility to spend $600 billion on versus the possibility that a country would want to smuggle a nuclear device in this country through a cargo container in a port? Where if it explodes, you have no idea where it came from. So, the, so this, this great emphasis to spend all this money on ballistic missile defense has not clearly got a good strategic purpose. Certainly, by the way, at the present time, there are no countries that just have a few weapons that can send a ballistic missile towards us now anyway. OK, now, if I didn't offend people with missile defense, let me, um, let me try here, because religion is always a good way to do it. Um, religion and science have had an, a, 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 a an uneasy truce over the years at various times. And um, an example where they collided was in 2001 in Afghanistan. This was before, this was before September 11th, when the Taliban were in control. And we're not uh, our avowed enemies at that time. But you may remember the famous and tragic example of these uh, statues of Buddha, these almost 2,000-year-old statues, which are a treasure for all humankind. And the Taliban at the time de had decided that in their interpretation of the Koran, no images of human faces should be, should be allowed. And so all statues in the country were going to be destroyed. And they would start with these. And there was a, an international outcry. And unfortunately, they were destroyed. We don't have them. And it was a loss for humanity, and certainly for the science of archaeology. At the same time in this country, at the exact same time in this country, then House Majority Leader Tom DeLay, who, by the way, has a degree in biology, put into the congressional record the following statement that the Columbine school shootings occurred in part, quote unquote, because our school systems teach our children that they're nothing but glorified apes who have evolutionized out of some primordial mud. So evolution is responsible for the Columbine school shootings. Okay. Now, there is a huge confusion about evolution in this country, which I want to talk about a little bit. And the confusion goes all the way to the top. The person who should be defining public policy, in this case, our president. And President Bush, as you know, in 2005 said, both sides ought to be properly taught. He was referring to evolution and something called intelligent design. So that people can understand what the debate is all about. Now, this intrinsically is not a stupid statement. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to say. If there are two sides. And that's the problem. This represents ignorance, scientific ignorance. Because there are not two sides to this debate. There's one manufactured side that doesn't exist in the real world outside of, of the media. Now, just to make it clear, and I'd be happy to give a lecture on evolutionary biology, but I'm not going to. But, the, but I should make the point that evolution is probably the most successful and impressive scientific theory of all time. It has been tested 
over and over and over again by all the hallmarks that make good science, by observation, prediction, and testing. It's predicted experiments that have been gone out and been performed and agreed with the predictions. And I see my friend Walter Isaacson in the audience, and, I, and, and he and I and all of us physicists have done this, have done this job on you, and we've convinced you Einstein is the, uh, is the greatest scientist of all time. Because, you know, we, the physicists, us physicists are, are certainly the most pompous and obnoxious of all scientists. And, but, you know, having, having studied this a lot, I think it, it, there's a really good statement, and we just haven't done the right kind of pop publicity campaign for Charles Darwin. Because if you think of any individual in some way who's changed science more than anyone else, I think there's a good, even more than Newton perhaps, Charles Darwin, a single individual who amassed the data and the theory to change the way we think about, the, about life on this planet, it's truly remarkable. And we should really hail him instead of, uh, instead of uh, uh, relegating him perhaps to the second tier, and in fact in this country, um, to derision. Now, what's intelligent design? That's a really good question. There's no good answer. And there's no good answer because it hasn't been subject to peer review and testing, like evolution. And I was going to have a slide going into the various versions of it. But the really important thing about intelligent design is the following. It's simply opposed to evolution. Intelligent design is an umbrella for all those groups that in one way or another are opposed to evolution. And the question, the really important question in this country is, why are people opposed to evolution? That's the question that's baffled me and got me involved in this whole issue. And I think the answer, and the reason I as a physicist have gotten involved in this, is that it's really, evolution is a straw man. This is really based on a fear of science. A fear, in particular, that because science does not explicitly mention God, science is inherently immoral. And I'll give you an example. Here's a statement from the, what used to be on the web pages of something now called the Discovery Institute which claims to be a scientific organization, at least the part of it that, that talks about this. It used to be, this part of the Discovery Institute, what used to be called the Center for the Renewal of Science and Culture, but that was kind of emotionally charged, so they, they've gotten rid of the word renewal. And um, in 1998, they do put a document that they said the proposition that human beings are created in the image of God is one of the bedrock principles on which Western civilization was built. This cardinal idea came under wholesale attack, drawing on the discoveries of modern science. The Discovery Institute Center seeks nothing less than the overthrow of materialism and its cultural legacies. And it had some goals. The goals were to defeat materialism and its destructive moral, cultural, and political legacies. This is a group nowadays in which if you hear, we'll say, you'll hear them say, we're just interested in good science, and evolution isn't good, good science. But they decided in advance that it's bad, it's bad science because it's immoral and to replace materialistic explanations with a theistic understanding. And their goal, in fact, was to begin, to begin attacking science teaching in the public schools in five years. In my own state of Ohio, within five years, that's precisely what happened. And that's how I got involved in this particular debate, as they tried to introduce the notion of intelligent design, whatever that was. Now, this, this notion that science is immoral is everywhere. And here's, a, here's an example from, taken from one document, which is evolution, which is based on Satan. And it's responsible for all the bad things in our society, including humanism, which is evil, divorce, euthanasia, homosexuality, pornography, abortion, racism, I don't know what that one was. And it is, of course, just working to destroy the basis of Christianity. That science is a force for evil. And evolution is just one particularly easy straw man because it involves the notion of us and whether we're special on Earth in a, in a particular way. Now, this is not just bad science. This is ridiculous theology. That's the other thing that's worth pointing out. It's a disservice to all people of faith to imply that it's better for our children to remain ignorant of the world than to risk the possibility that knowledge may somehow undermine their faith. That, I would argue, is in fact what we're fighting in Afghanistan. And, and I want to just touch on this for, for a moment, this question of God and science. I'd be happy to talk about it a lot more because I thought a lot about it. But the important thing is, while there is an inherent tension, and my friend Steve Weinberg has said it very well, I think, by saying that science doesn't make it impossible to believe in God. It just makes it possible to not believe in God. And that's a true statement. Before science, everything is a miracle. Once you have science, you have the option of assuming that there's nothing but physical causes for physical effects. 